All right, this is pathology of early pregnancy, uh, also regarding the placenta. So starting off here, just recognizing uh, some of the placental anatomy. So <clears throat> uh, this here is showing the uh, is showing the cords, and if you notice, there is um, two. Um, the blue and one of the red and the red represents the oxygenated and the blue represents the deoxygenated and um, <clears throat> uh, the, the funny thing with this though is that uh, the red the, the oxygenated in this case is a vein and so there's one vein and two arteries so uh, within the boundary of the myometrium so the myometrium is the muscle of the um, uterus is a layer of decidua uh, from which the, mat the maternal vessels or spiral arteries originate and deliver blood to and from the inner villa spaces so see right here this layer right here so here's the myometrium this back layer and then right here we have the decidua and the decidua has these spiral arteries and these spiral arteries are flowing blood into and out of this space and this space is where the uh, placenta, the fetal hemoglobin, comes in contact with the mother's hemoglobin, adult hemoglobin. So, chorionic villi sprout. So here's some of these. Um, this is a placental septum here, and the uh, chorionic villi are. Uh, where are those located in here? Uh, anchoring villus. There's one there. But anyway, I think these are the villi here, in the chorion. Um, they spill out from the chorion to where the umbilical vessels carrying the embryonic blood branch and terminate. Provides a large contact area that allows for nutrient exchange. There is one umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries. As I was saying earlier, two arteries, one vein. Uh, the first trimester villus, central stroma surrounded by two epithelial uh, layers. So, basically understanding that um, we have the stroma in the middle and there's two layers of epithelium around that. So there's, it says here we've got two arrows, shows the syncytiotrophoblast. So there it is right there. This is the syncytiotrophoblast, the two arrows. And then the one arrow, which is right here, is showing the cytotrophoblast. So it's the cytotrophoblast out here, cytotrophoblast on the inside. And it says to also note the red blood cells indicates less than 10 weeks. And it's good to know. Now, uh, third trimester villus, central stroma with dense network of dilated capillaries and thinned out syncytio and cytotrophoblast layers. So, disorders in early pregnancy. Uh, says, uh, spontaneous abortion, also known as a miscarriage. Pregnancy loss before 20 weeks gestation. Most occur before 12 weeks of gestation. So, most of the time, if you're going to lose a baby, it's going to be before 12 weeks have even passed. And usually what it is, my understanding is that the, there is some sort of chromosomal problem with the growing fetus. And the, the body basically recognizes that and, um, and it terminates it. So, uh, however that process works. Um, 10 to 15% of clinically recognized pregnancies result in spontaneous abortion. So, um, that's a pretty, pretty high percentage. Somewhere between 1 in 10 and 1 in about 8. Um, are going to work out. Uh, fetal chromosomal anomalies are present in 50% of, of early aborted fetuses. So I guess that that's what that's saying there is that's half the time. I thought it was most of the time. But it looks like it's about half the time. It's because of that. Um, maternal causes. So sometimes it's a luteal phase defect. So if the mother the mother does not uh, from the corpus luteum produce enough progesterone then uh, that drop in progesterone is going to result in 
increased uterine contractions and expulsion of the fetal contents. Um, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus and other endocrine disorders can, can, are teratogenic on the baby and then fetus. Physical defects of the uterus, leiomyomas, polyps, bicornet uterus. Baby can't grow in there if there's a giant leiomyoma in there, big muscle, smooth muscle cell tumor, or if there's polyps or something in the way that preventing it from growing. Maternal vascular issues, antiphospholipid syndrome, hypertension or coagulopathies can also cause this, as well as infections such as um, or typical torch infections, but also listeria, well, uh, which is from an ascending infection, and is common in the second trimester aborted fetus. And then there's also conditions we don't really know why it happened, we just call it idiopathic. So an ectopic pregnancy is the implantation of the fetus in any site other than the uterus. It doesn't just have to be in the fallopian tubes, it could be maybe that maybe at a went out into the abdominal cavity. You know, it could be anywhere. Not anywhere, but you get what I mean. So, one in 150 pregnancies become ectopic. That's less than 1% there. Most common location for the ectopic pregnancy, about 90% of them, end up in the fallopian tube. Also, it can happen in the ovary, it can happen in the abdominal cavity. Ovarian pregnancy is due to the rare fertilization and trapping of the ovum within the follicle just at the time of rupture. Um, so that's self-explanatory. Most common predisposing condition is pelvic inflammatory disease resulting in fallopian tube scarring. So basically normally the fallopian tube is supposed to be this nice clear shot from the ovary into the uterus but sometimes if a person has pelvic inflammatory disease maybe from um, gonorrhea or chlamydia or maybe endometriosis or something, I don't know what else can cause it. Um, it gets this scarring in there for the inflammation and the scarring makes it so that you don't have a very clear shot and the egg gets stuck up in some scars and, and can't make its way down to the uterus and so it starts growing where it's at and that's not good. It says, uh, but 50% of cases occur in normal tubules, so only half the time, uh, less than half the time, it looks like um, is it even from this? Other predisposing conditions, uh, peritubal adhesions due to endometriosis or appendicitis, leiomyomas or prior surgery, um, IUD does not increase the risk. That's good to know. Um, labs that suggest ectopic pregnancy or non-viable intrauterine gestation. Um, uh, I should probably explain this. Let me go back a little bit. Explain why the IUD does not increase the risk. So, you're less likely to have to get pregnant at all, to conceive at all with an IUD. Okay. Now, if you happen to conceive with an IUD, which is extremely unlikely, if you happen to, of those, there's um, a higher percentage that do become um, ectopic pregnancies, but because putting an IUD prevents um, so much, uh, it prevents fertilization so much, your risk is not increased in general. But, but if you were to get pregnant of those, there'd be a higher percentage that are, that are um, ectopic. So labs suggest ectopic pregnancy or non-viable intrauterine gestation. Some of those labs, labs are if the HCG level is really high, so HCG stands for human chorionic gonadotropin, it's secreted from the placenta. You can detect it in serum, I believe about seven days, can detect it in, can detect it in um, urine at about 14 days, and that would result in a positive pregnancy test. The thing is with with a molar pregnancy, the HCG is going to be really, really, really high. I'm sorry, I actually said this wrong here. <laughs> if the HCG is less than 3,000. So if it's above, if it's really, really high, you're thinking molar pregnancy, but if it's too low, if it's not high enough, 
and the progesterone is also too low, then there's a high, li high likelihood of an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so too low, you're thinking ectopic. Too high, you're thinking molar. Um, don't forget this proge this progesterone as well. Progesterone is also um, um, released originally released from released from the corpus luteum, and then a little later on, it's released from the uh, I guess uh, changed <laughs> into progesterone in the placenta. So progesterone is too low. You're thinking, hmm. Maybe the placenta is not growing like it should. I'm making a progesterone. So less than 12. So the likelihood of pregnancy or non viable intrauterine gestation is 97% with those. That's pretty high. Serum progesterone level less than 5 is uh, non viable. So if it's, if it's lower than that, it's uh, not even considered viable whether in an ectopic or intrauterine location. So it doesn't even matter where it is. If it's less than that, it's not viable. Greater than 25 suggests viable uterine gestation. So greater than 25, good. Less than 5, not even viable. Um, with a gestation age more than 38 days or a serum HCG level more than 2,500, intrauterine gestation should be visible on ultrasound. So if, if you're 38 days along, or if this is above 2,500, then when you don't do an ultrasound, you should see something in there. Um, tubal pregnancy is the most common cause of hematosalpinx, blood filled in the fallopian tube. So, hemato is a common way of saying blood, and the salpinx is referring to this fallopian tube. I'm not sure what language they're getting that from, but um, I always suspect uh, with tubal hematomas. Um, basically this thing ruptures, a bunch of blood gets in the fallopian tubes. Um, placenta is poorly attached to the wall of the tube and bleeding occurs with partial separation of the placenta from the wall. Uh, proper deciduization is lacking in the fallopian tube. Rupture can also occur uh, with uh, hemoperitoneum, hemoperitoneum rather, uh, due to distension and thinning of the fallopian tube. Least, less commonly, tubal pregnancy may spontaneously regress with resorption of the conceptus. So sometimes it can just go away. Um, there's some pictures here. Um, Rupture site, chorionic villi, unopened and open fallopian. This is an open, this is an unopened tube with an ectopic pregnancy. So this is the tube being opened up here. This is an early rupture, ectopic pregnancy. Looks like with twins. Wow. That's pretty remarkable. Okay, so clinical course of ectopic pregnancy. Onset of severe abdominal pain about six weeks after last menstrual period. So if a person says, oh, I haven't had a menstrual period in about six weeks, so they're, you know, ways overdue, and all of a sudden they have this just incredible pain, you might think, hmm, could be octopic pregnancy. If ruptured, can present with shock with acute abdomen. Uh, studies, uh, human chorionic gonadotropin, ultrasound, laparoscopy, sticking a little camera up there, can elect to do an amitral biopsy. That's rarely helpful. So I don't know what this is supposed to be showing, but looks like these may be ovaries or something. Maybe this is where it's growing in the ovary. Uh, this is acute salpingitis, which means the fallopian tubes are inflamed. Or, um, yeah. Other fallopian tube disorders, so inflammation, pelvic inflammatory disease may be caused by gonococci, chlamydiae, and enteric bacteria, characterized by pelvic pain, adnexal tenderness, fever, and vaginal discharge. So these are the things that can cause it. Um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, or E. coli, and... Uh, it hurts, it's tender, you get a fever, and discharge comes out of the vagina. 
Those are all indicative of pelvic inflammatory disease. Or it could be superative salpingitis. may be caused by any of the pyogenic organisms, often by one or more. So gonorrhea is over 60% of cases. Hydrosalpinx occurs when um, infecting organisms disappear and pus undergoes proteolysis to a thin serous fluid. Tuberculous salpingitis is rare in the United States, but important cause of infertility in other areas. Paratubal cysts. Uh, so, uh, moving on here, sorry. Paratubal cysts is, well, I mean, I've heard look at these pictures here. All right. Not, not too much to worry about. Uh, okay, so paratubal cysts. Benign, one and two centimeter translucent serous cysts that arise from malaria and duct remnants. Hydatids of Morga Morgagni. I, I don't know what that, that means. That looks familiar, but I don't remember what that means. Um, larger cysts of the fimbriae or broad ligament. Very common, but not really clinically significant. So it looks like you can get cysts in there, and that's what they call them. It's odd. Okay, fallopian tube tumors. Adeno, ad adenomatoid tumor, which is benign mesothelial cell uh, lesions, nodules. See the pictures, it says. Adenocarcinoma, rare. Need to see lumen and mucosal involvement. Present with abnormal vaginal discharge or bleeding. Typically uh, managed with ovarian cancer chemotherapy protocols. So if a person gets one of these adenomatoid tumors, ad adenocarcinoma, you're going to see some bleeding, some discharge, and you can, you can fix it, hopefully, with some chemotherapy agents. All right. Disorders of late pregnancy. So what can happen later on? Well, sometimes uh, twin placentas can occur. They call this dichorionic, diamniotic, um, if there's two babies there. But uh, let's see what this says here. Uh, must be able to identify by looking at the placenta. Monozygotic, identical twins, division of one fertilized ovum, whereas dizygotic, paternal, fertilization of two ova. So there's three or four different instances that can occur here. One is the dichorionic, diamnionic, and this is the most safe, if I remember correctly, because that way, um, you know, these are totally separated, two two placentas, you're not worrying about, you know, one baby getting more blood or something like that. Um, babies aren't going to get wrapped up in each other. This one here looks like they're sharing a placenta, and sometimes one baby will get more blood. Um, I can't remember the name of that condition, but one baby ends up big and the other one ends up small, and actually the one you worry about more is the big one, uh, if I remember correctly. So the dichorio dichorionic, diamniotic. We have a fused placenta. And this is a monochorionic, diamniotic. Um, so, uh, have, they have one chorion, that would be this big overarching uh, sac there, and then they, but they have two amniotic sacs. They're not sharing amniotic fluid. And this is where they're both in the same, and this is a little bit more dangerous uh, because they can get wrapped up in each other, get wrapped up in each other's cords. Uh, when they're delivering, um, one baby's, you know, chin, get hooked on the other baby's chin, things like that can occur. It can be dangerous. Um, three types of placenta. So I just talked about this. Um, twin twin transfusion syndrome um, is abnormal sharing of fetal uh, circulations, this is what I was talking about earlier, um, through an arterial venous shunt. So, they're both sharing blood, but one baby gets a little more than the other one. I think this is maybe what this is showing here. No, it's not. I don't know. Um, so, complication of monochorionic twin pregnancy. So, monochorionic is right here. So they got one, uh, one chorion. Um, 
And, um, where was I? There we go. As all monochorionic twin placentas have vascular anastomoses, suspect if one twin is 25% larger than the other twin. Marked disparity in fetal blood volume may result in death of one or both fetuses. Donor fetus dies from lack of blood. Recipient fetus dies from congestive heart failure. So one baby is not getting enough blood, and the other baby is getting too much blood and it messes with his heart. And that's not good. Abnormal placent uh, ab excuse me, abnormalities of placental implantation. Placenta previa. Implantation of the lower uterine segment um, or cervix. So basically, uh, it shows it really nicely here. Um, sometimes the placenta lies right over the opening, and when this vaginal opening starts to cut over the cervix, it opens up, blood comes out, and the mother would bleed to death. The baby can't get out because the placenta is in the way. And that's not good. If it's partially open, that's not good. And sometimes it's just really close. This is marginal, low lying, this is complete. Um, so placenta, placenta previa is where you know implants in the lower uterine segment down here. So uh, usually it's painless bleeding that'll occur. And you need to perform a C-section or that mother's gonna bleed out. There's also something called placenta accreta. And uh, Placenta accreta is where, remember earlier on we were talking up here, um, I can find it, here we go, where here in the decidua uh, is where these blood vessels are and, and you know, the, the placenta is attached in the proper layer. Well, sometimes it can, it can go deeper. The placenta can get all the way down so it's actually attached on the myometrium itself instead of on the decidua. Uh, parita can go all, all the way down here. Now if that happens, then uh, the the placenta is not going to be able to detach um, properly. And if it does manage to de uh, detach, the mother's going to bleed too much. So here's I think some trying to illustrate probably what's going on here. Um, so it says partial or complete absence of decision deciduous with adherence of the placental villus tissue directly to the myometrium and failure of the placental separation. Serious postpartum bleeding, which may be life-threatening, is one of the complications there. Common predisposing factors are placenta previa, 60% of the time, which means it's attaching too low down by the um, lower half of the uterus, and a previous C-section. So if you have placenta previa, or if you have had a C-section in the past, which makes sense because that would result in some scarring, maybe it, that's you know disrupted where it's attached, um, so now it's attaching too deep down. The so placenta accreta is divided into the classic form, accreta, and two other forms, increta and procreta. So uh, basically it's how deep they go. So increta is this image right here. And this is where the placenta attaches deep into the uterine wall and penetrates the uterine muscle, but not the uterine serosa. So it's gone, you know, uh, maybe they're talking about this image. I'm not really sure which one they're talking about. This one seems like it hasn't gone through the serosa, but it's gone into the muscle. Um, whereas placenta percreta, it's this one, I'm sure, um, penetrates the uterine muscle and the uterine serosa. Both may rupture during delivery. And maybe what you can think of this is um, P comes after I. So, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. So I is not as deep in as P is. Uh, both may also rupture during delivery. Vasa previa. So, Vasa previa is when fetal blood vessels run through the fetal membranes that are laying over the cervix. So basically, um, you've got blood vessels in the way, and, uh, and that's going to cause problems. So the type of placenta associated with battled or placenta, I don't know what that means, or 
velamentous vessel insertion may be torn when the vessel when the membranes rupture and that that would cause excess bleeding which would be dangerous placental infections can be in the form of chorioamnionitis villitis and funicitis can develop by two pathways a sounding infection through the birth canal more common usually bacterial um, so in other words it comes up from below localized infection may cause premature rupture of the membranes and preterm delivery allows bacteria to pass into the normally sealed amniotic cavity causing acute chorioamnionitis in other words all the contents in there become inflamed in the fetal membranes amniotic fluid becomes cloudy and purulent with exudates and on histology the chorion amnion contains a polymorphonuclear or in other words neutrophils a leukocyte infiltrate accompanied by edema and congestion of the vessels and um, think of torch infections all right preeclampsia and eclampsia and these are basically the same thing except for eclampsia has seizures and preeclampsia doesn't have seizures but it's basically the mom has really high blood pressure um, after 20 weeks of pregnancy um, and she pees out protein okay that's kind of how you pick it up so preeclampsia is systemic syndrome characterized by widespread maternal endothelial dysfunction and symptoms complex of hypertension proteinuria and edema yeah they get edema too so basically the things I look for is proteinuria and hypertension um, occurs in three to five percent of pregnant women usually in a third trimester and in prima paris when the symptoms worsen and seizures uh, excuse me and seizures develop <laughs> um, it is called eclampsia okay so seizures eclampsia. this is basically this is just covering everything I said already disseminated intervascular coagulation is a major complication in other words blood clots form along with acute renal failure and pulmonary edema so it can mess up your kidneys and it can give you a really bad swelling and everywhere think about it you're peeing out your protein it's the proteins in your in your serum that allow you to uh, to you know retain your water um, to a large degree so if you pee all those out you're gonna start swelling up because um, your water won't be disper dispersed properly okay so a little bit of uh, morphology here um, placenta reveals la uh, various changes most of which reflect oh sorry I think I might have missed a piece here yeah let me go up a little bit I apologize 10% with severe preeclampsia develop HELP syndrome or H-E-L-L-P syndrome this is hemolysis elevated liver enzymes low platelets okay so you see the h-e-l-l-p pathogenesis the placenta plays a central role since symptoms disappear rapidly after delivery of the placenta critical abnormalities include diffuse endothelial dysfunction vasoconstriction leading to hypertension and increased vascular permeability resulting in proteinuria and edema pathophysiological aberrations uh, include abnormal placental uh, abnormal placental vasculature with spiral arteries ill prepared to meet the third trimester supply demands so in other words there's not enough spiral arteries there and in the third trimester you need a lot and you don't have enough um, endothelial dysfunction and imbalance of angiogenic and anti-angiogenic factors response by ischemia placenta uh, in preeclampsia, high levels of soluble FMS-like tyrosine kinase and soluble endo, I think it's supposed to be a different word, but endoglin, bring about a decrease in angiogenesis much earlier than in normal pregnancy. So basically, you stop making enough blood vessels, and that's bad. This results in defective vascular development in the placenta. Preeclampsia is associated with hypercoagulable state related to reduced endothelial production of prostaglandin I2, a potent anti-thrombotic factor and increased re uh, release of procoagulate factors. Morphology. The placenta reveals various changes, most of which reflect 
malperfusion, ischemia, and vascular injury. Placental infarcts, large and more numerous, uh, small ones occur in normal pregnancy. Retroplacental hematomas due to bleeding and instability of uteroplacental vessels. Decidua basalis abnormalities including thrombosis, fibrinoid necrosis, and acute atherosis. Villus ischemia. And I think that's pretty self explanatory. Changes in the female. The brain, gross microscopic hemorrhage, small vessel thrombi, kidney, endothelial cell swelling, fibrinogen derived amorphous dense deposits on endothelial side of glomerular or basement membrane. Severe disease may cause bilateral renal cortical necrosis, liver hemorrhage, fibrin, fibrin, and thrombi, and acute athero atherosis of uterine vessels in eclampsia. Note fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel walls, subendothelial macro macrophages, and perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. So yeah, showing some good pictures of what's going on here. Coming close to the end, um, now we're talking a little bit about... Um, um, here we are. Uh, trophoblastic diseases. So uh, this constitutes a spectrum of tumors and tumor-like conditions characterized by proliferation of placental tissue, either villus or trophoblastic. So the first one here is a hydatid form mole. And um, a mole is basically the baby is not growing, something else is growing, but it's not necessarily baby and it's it's not gonna it's not gonna survive and it's gonna grow really weird and it's gonna cause problems. <laughs> so um, Usually, or sometimes it can happen from, you know, two sperm hitting one egg or from a sperm getting an egg that doesn't have any uh, ovum in it. Um, but let's go through it here. So, hydrogen form mole is characterized by histologically bicystic swelling of the chorionic villi along with variable trophoblastic proliferation. Most present in fourth or fifth month of pregnancy with vaginal bleeding and a uterus that is larger than expected. So girl starts bleeding and her, they look at her uterus and they're like, whoa, this is way bigger than it's supposed to be at this point. You know, let's say you're 10 weeks along or something um, and it looks like you're 20 weeks along or something. Um, so cor uh, correct recognition is important because moles are associated with increased risk of persistent trophoblastic disease or an invasive mole, so it's growing throughout the body. Choriocarcinoma. Uh, Benign non-invasive moles can be identified by gross histologic, cyto cytogenic, and flow cytometric analysis. Complete. M most or all the villi are edematous, and many show trophoblastic hyperplasia. Uh, cytogenic and or flow cytometric studies of these moles show that most have a 46XX diploid pattern derived from the sperm androgenesis presumed to result from fertilization of an egg that has lost its chromosomes by a single sperm, 23X. Interesting. So they think that a, an egg didn't have any chromosomes and a single sperm went in there with an X. And then, then it divided. Serum HCG levels continue to rise after 14 weeks gestation instead of dropping as in the typical normal gestation. Monitoring HCG levels is important because up to 10% of moles develop into persistent or invasive moles. Gross uterus, so you gotta keep checking the HCG to make sure it doesn't you know, stay elevated. Because if it stays elevated, you, mean it might, you think it might be somewhere else. Gross, uterus is large for dates, but not fetus, there's no, not a fetus in there. I'll say no fetus is present. present. Um, a micro, you see large avascular villi and areas of atypical trophoblastic proliferation. Evidence of toxemia, pregnancy, hypertension, edema, albuminemia, albuminuria, which means albumin in the urine, is common. On ultrasound exam, there's a snowstorm pattern. I'm hoping they have a picture of that, but it just looks like a TV that's not connected to the fish or whatever. Um, where was I? Snowstorm appearance. Okay. Oh, there it is. Um, 
areas of increased echogenicity with small cystic spaces, or improved ultrasound may actually see the edematous villi. No fetus is present. No identical cord, identifiable cord, or amniotic membranes are present. So it's just a big mess in there. Partial mole differences, uh, this is basically just going to highlight the differences from the complete moles. So in gross, you'll see some villi um, are edematous, avascular and grape-like. Trophoblastic proliferation is only focal. Karyotype is mostly triploid. The 69XXY, two haploid sperm, two 23X, fertilizing a 23X egg. HCG elevated to lesser degree than in a complete mole. Viable embryo persists for two week, for a few weeks, and fetal parts may be present upon abortion of the resultant mole on micro, microscopy. Micronucleated red blood cells in the villus blood vessels. Many patients with partial and complete moles are at extremes of childbearing age between 20, uh, excuse me, below 20 or above 40. So really young women or really or older women are likely to have moles. Uh, most present spontaneous, uh, excuse me, most present spontaneous pregnancy loss, vaginal bleeding, and other signs previously discussed or undergo curatage due to abnormalities and ultrasound. In complete moles, the HCG levels can reach greater than 150,000, whereas levels in partial moles reach between 27 to 80,000. Serial levels of HCG usually climb faster than for the usual normal single or even multiple pregnancy. Virtually no partial and or 2.5% of complete moles evolve into malignant trophoblastic neoplasm, or choriocarcinoma. After curatage, patients need to be followed with HCG levels um, times six months minimum. All right, now you've got the invasive mole. This is basically where the mole gets places where it's not supposed to be, and it's almost like cancer in someone. Uh, it becomes locally destructive and invades the parametria, tissues, and blood vessels. Um, these do not grow into organs as true metastases, so it's not, not really like it's a metastasine, but the villi are invasive, um, which is not the case in choriocarcinoma. Um, before the advent of chemotherapy, eventually re uh, regress unless a fatal hemorrhage has occurred. Chemotherapy is good, but hysterectomy may be necessary. Bleeding and uterine rupture are potential complications. So now we're into choriocarcinoma. This is a malignant neoplasm of trophoblastic cells derived from previously normal, abnormal, normal or abnormal pregnancy. Generally, it is rapidly invasive and widely metastasizing, but once identified, responds well to chemotherapy. It is an uncommon condition that arises one in 20,000 pregnancies in the United States. One in 40 high additive form moles may be expected to give rise to choriocarcinoma. So one in 40 out of these high additive form moles can, can turn into choriocarcinoma. Um, one in 150,000 pregnancies give rise to choriocarcinoma. So it is preceded by several conditions. 50% arise in high additive form moles, 25% arise in previous abortions, 22% arise in normal pregnancies. Interesting. So, um, looks like favored metastatic sites are the lung, the vagina, could be also the brain, liver, kidney. Um, you're going to present it with some bloody brown, foul smelling fluid um, post pregnancy or miscarriage. Um, chest radiographs and bones already disclose the presence of metastasis, metastases, whatever. Titers of HCG can be higher than hydrated form moles. Villi are not present, rather bizarre trophoblastic cells. Uh, tumor invades the underlying myometrium, frequently penetrates blood vessels and lymphatics, and in some cases extends out into the uterine serosa and into adjacent structures. Treatment, surgery and chemotherapy with or without radiation, depending on the stage. So we're going to get rid of this. Results of chemotherapy are very useful in most, resulting in up to 100% cure or remission. High-risk metastases are those 
um, which involve liver and brain. Five, per five year survival rate drops to 75% um, with chemotherapy. All right, placental site trophoblastic tumor, PSTTs, comprise less than 2% of the GTD and present, uh, presents as neoplastic polygonal cells infiltrating the endometrium at the site of placental implanta implantation. Intermediate trophoblastic cells, mononuclear cells with the menocytoplasm, um, either abnormal uterine bleeding or amenorrhea with moderate elevation in HCG. Preceded by normal pregnancy, 50%, spontaneous abortion, approximately 15%, and hydatin form, 20%. Prognosis. Localized disease or tumors diagnosed less than two years following pregnancy equals excellent prognosis. Tumors diagnosed two or, or more years following pregnancy with lung involvement or with advanced age is poor prognosis. So they catch it early on. Uh, it's good. Catch it later. It's not good. And that brings us to the end.